um, Dr. Borning and Dr. Rowling are both in our physical therapy department, and their research is on uh, incontinence. And so we're going to let them take over and uh, welcome them. And if you didn't sign in, I'll get you signed in um, as a still healthy credit, okay? Great. Well, thank you for having us, uh, Tanya. Thanks for inviting us. And we are going to talk, we're going to talk about bladder health and bladder wellness and tell you a little bit about incontinence and then at the end we'll tell you a little bit about our research and what we're doing uh, looking at this issue. And so if you're surprised that this is a physical therapy issue, it is. And um, Dr. Tammy's going to talk a little bit about that and do away with all the formalities here. So we're going to start out. I, I have a problem. Oh, every no. time somebody comes close to me with a dying torch, I get nervous and f a little spritzer. I went, eh, and oh, my God, <laughs> such a butter. And when I laugh, I kind of spritz. <laughs> I've been licking for years, years. And oh, somebody will give you a bit of a tickle. And then the next thing you know, boom, you're wet. <laughs> I don't want to be painted, I want to be dry. Anybody want to tell me what's going on? No one wants to talk. One in three women have this issue. I know that someone has created something fantastic. Looks like a really thin neck and it's called poise. Let me show you what I would have looked like if I had poise. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Liberty, liberty. <laughs> because that's probably one of the biggest things about incontinence is that most people are pretty shy about talking about it. Um, and sometimes when Tammy and I will encounter folks who know that this is our area of research or one of our areas of research, they'll say, well, I have this friend who has this problem that I want to talk to you about. <laughs> okay, that's great, right? So um, that's really one of the big issues, and I think Tammy's going to talk a little bit more maybe about that later on. So what is incontinence? Well, actually, this is one of the issues when we look at some of the research to try and establish um, prevalence of incontinence in the population is because it's been defined um, kind of differently in a lot of different studies, but probably the most um, well-accepted definition is leakage occurring at least once in the past year, any type of leakage. And then there's different types of incontinence, and Tammy will describe those further in a couple minutes. Um, but they, that can be caused either by coughing, laughing, or exercising. So a lot of times that's one of the things women will say, oh yeah, when I laugh, and you heard Whoopi say that, you know, get a little tickle and then psh, little spritz, right? Um, the other thing that it can be caused by is a very strong urge to urinate. And sometimes women will have a strong, or people will have a strong urge to urinate, but not have incontinence, so they won't have any leakage. Um, but when you do have leakage, that's um, a particular type. You can have both of those. And then there's other reasons that people can be incontinent as well. And we're not going to talk a lot about those today. Um, but you know, individuals who maybe have mobility deficits that have a hard time maybe donning and doffing their clothes might have difficulty getting to the bathroom in time and therefore have incontinence as well. So who's affected? Well, women are affected more than men. Men typically experience incontinence as a consequence of prostate um, problems. So of course, as men age, their prostates become enlarged. Um, typically, and therefore that's why they present with um, uh, incontinence. Also, following prostatectomy for men who have um, prostate disease and have a prostatectomy, almost all of those men will present with some type of incontinence um, that needs to be resolved. So this is the prevalence. You can see that um, the numbers increase um, as you age. So we see that. And then this idea of prevalence in women is a lot more complicated, um, partly because, again, we haven't asked the question the same way every single time we've been looking at it. Um, but also, there's a whole, 
host, and I'm going to talk about those in just a second, a whole host of risk factors which influence whether or not um, incontinence is present or, present or not, or whether people experience incontinence. But you can see there the overall, this is based on a big study in the US. I think it was like almost 3,000 um, participants in this particular study. And this doesn't talk at all about the severity of incontinence either. So this could be from having um, one episode of incontinence every month, or this could be one episode of incontinence every day, or multiple episodes of incontinence every day. So these are the risk factors that have been identified in the literature. And this first column here are those that are pretty well substantiated by the literature. So we're pretty certain that all of these are related to um, or have our risk factors for incontinence. So the first there is pregnancy and childbirth. We know that 30 to 60 percent of women um, experience incontinence during pregnancy. So most women have some type of incontinence during their pregnancy. And then we also know that women who have a vaginal delivery have a higher incidence of um, incontinence than women who have a cesarean section. Um, in particular, instrumented vaginal deliveries tend to increase at least slightly the risk for incontinence versus non-instrumented um, vaginal deliveries. We also know that obesity increases your risk for incontinence. Um, and you can see there are four times the um, risk of incontinence for women than women who are of normal weight. And most of the time, obesity um, I think it increases as you move towards being more overweight, but most of the time they're defining that as a BMI of 30 plus. Smoking also increases the risk. Um, that's a pretty clear risk factor and has been substantiated in the literature. Um, menopause and aging. Um, as we age, there's changes in our uh, tissues that unfortunately lead to um, changes in our ability to be continent. Now that's not to say it's normal that when you're 60 or 58 or 55 to have incontinence, um, but it does increase. We see that as a greater risk factor as you get older. Now some of the ones that are not so well substantiated in the literature, constipation, and actually it's, uh, we were getting ready for this. Both Tammy and I were looking to try and find somebody that said constipation was a big issue and couldn't find any literature that really supported that so much. Um, high impact exercise has been um, described as being a problematic. And so high impact exercise, thinking about women who participate in running sports, women who participate in gymnastics, so any kind of jumping sports, versus women who are participating in um, sports like swimming or um, walking activities. And it's interesting because this study that's cited here was a systematic review, and what they found was that, you know, it really isn't substantiated based on the literature that was available at that time. Um, that there is um, a risk, an increased risk, based upon participation in those activities. There's some suggestion in the literature that ethnicity and race are indicated as risk factors, and that white women are at a higher risk for um, incontinence than other women of other ethnicities and races, and that a previous hysterectomy might also be indicated as a risk factor. And I think now I'm handing it over to Tammy. Hopefully we won't make too much noise with this microphone. Okay, so quality of life. These women who have incontinence, their, their quality is decreased. I mean, there's also, they can have increased risk of falls. A lot of them avoid exercise. I work with many women who are endurance runners, marathon runners, and they want to give it up because they're leaking, they're filling pads as they're running. Um, socially, you know, it's, it's embarrassing, and a lot of women will leak during intercourse, so they'll start to try to avoid intimate um, activities. Mentally, these women, um, they are amazing. They know where the restroom is in every store, every building they go into. They, they map the bathrooms. They know exactly where it's at. Um, also, you know, they tend to wear 
wear darker clothing. And so I, I treat women in my practice, and when they come in at the end of their treatment sessions with white shorts on, I'm thrilled because it means that they have more confidence to wear lighter colored clothing. And then the cost of this. Um, you know, it's expensive, whether you have to wear, you know, a panty liner every day versus a menstrual pad, or some people are, are, have so much leakage they need to wear, you know, an incontinence pad or a, an adult brief, and those are really expensive. And so to prevent it, for those of you who are sitting there who don't have incontinence but want to learn how to prevent from having it, these are some prevention tips. Um, maintaining, you know, a, a more healthy um, weight, also exercising, not smoking. You know, when you're smoking, you tend to cough more. That downward pressure of coughing can weaken the pelvic floor. Avoiding constipation. Just making sure that you, you keep the nice, normal, softer stools. Um, I wanted to include this picture in case some of you have more difficulty defecating. There's actually a proper way to doing it. I don't know if you guys knew that. Um, but you kind of want to sit with your spine straight leaning forward with your, with your elbows on your knees, and this is the biggie, putting a little foot rest, like a little step stool, um, underneath your feet. So like I know when I'm traveling, I like to make sure my pelvic floor is protected, so I always do this, but when I travel, I'll take a hotel bathroom and put a hotel bathroom, a trash can from the hotel bathroom on its side and rest my feet on it. And that brings my knees higher than my hips. And the reason why is we have a muscle called puborectalis. And it goes from your pubic bone all the way around your rectum back to the front to your pubic bone, like a rubber band. And if that muscle's tight, it takes your rectum and it holds it like this. And it makes it hard to get feces in a tube that looks like this. So if you can put your foot on a sex stool and even like lean forward like that, it'll loosen up the puborectalis, it'll cause your anal rectal angle to be more at a, at a normal angle, and it's easier to defecate. So instead of straining and pushing, because um, if you strain and push, what does that do to your pelvic floor? It bulges it. And we want nice, healthy, strong pelvic floors. So we don't want to be straining and pushing. So by following this little technique, hopefully some of you can avoid straining and keeping your pelvic floor more healthy. And then pelvic floor strengthening exercises, which we're all going to do here in a minute. So the different types of urinary incontinence, I'm going to talk about three types today. One of them is stress. There is problem with the gatekeeper here, with stress incontinence. So whenever you have a cough, last sneeze, jump, lift, anything that's an intra-abdominal pressure pushing down on that bladder, you need to have pretty strong pelvic floor muscles to counteract that downward pressure by pushing back up. In these cases, if you have a weak pelvic floor, it can't overcome the downward pressure. And so the gatekeeper, your muscles, allows it to leak. And that's stress urinary incontinence. Versus urge incontinence, urge is a very different thing. I kind of think of urge incontinence as a naughty little teenager. The bladder doesn't want to follow the rules. It wants to do what it wants to do and on its own time. And so it doesn't want to do what it's supposed to be doing. And that's what urge incontinence is. Your bladder should be staying relaxed. And when it's time to go to the bathroom, you should get a signal to tell it to go. And then you go to the restroom. And when you sit down and urinate, your bladder should then contract. With urge incontinence, it's contracting when it's not supposed to be. And that's when women get this strong urge to go, and they have to go. Also, um, there are certain triggers that can cause urge incontinence. So some of you might experience key in door syndrome, which means when you get home, you put your key in the door, and you get this overwhelming strong urge to go, and you're running to the restroom. That's a trigger. Or you hear running water. So some of you brushing your teeth, or in the shower, hearing that running water makes you want to go to the bathroom or cold weather. So those are triggers that can cause um, the urgency with urge incontinence. And then the third type is mixed, and that's people who have both stress and urge. you got both types. So for treatments for stress, we need to make sure we strengthen this little gatekeeper so it keeps the urine in until we're ready for it to come out. And so we're going to talk about behavioral things that as, uh, today you guys can start incorporating in your lifestyle. We'll talk about some pharmacologic and then really quickly just some invasive um, treatment techniques. So one is weight loss. This study by Subak looked at women who um, were moderately obese on the BMI scale. And so they weighed 200 pounds or more. And they also had to experience urinary continence at least four times a week. And so for these women, they lost about 15% of their body weight. Or the women who were 200 pounds, they lost 30 pounds. 
and they had more than a 50% reduction in urinary incontinence just by losing weight. Strength eating exercises, me being a physical therapist, this is what's you know, near and near to my heart, um, but it is the gold standard treatment. Even though sometimes in clinical practice it's not being done as the gold standard, um, the literature says it is the gold standard. And there was a Cochrane um, database with medic review this year, and it said that pelvic floor strengthening should be taught by a physical therapist using internal assessment and treatment techniques, and this should be the first line of defense. Um, I know in, in Britain, before they pay for surgery, they have to show that they've gone through an exercise program that did not work before they do surgeries. So really it's important that exercise be included. And a lot of times, how many of you guys have heard of Kegel? named after Dr. Arnold Kegel from the 40s, who's an obstetrician. So Kegel exercises, it's when you want to um, squeeze your pelvic floor and hold it and then relaxing it. And it's really important that we do two different types. You want to do um, slow twitch and fast twitch. Because right now all of your slow twitch fibers are firing so you're not leaking in your chairs. Fast twitch, which makes up 30% of your pelvic floor, you need to engage when you have to pass gas and it's not the right time to be passing gas. You're gonna to to fire something really quickly and strongly. Those are your fast twitch. So it's so important to have both types of muscle fibers strong. So the traditional Kegel idea is to squeeze your pelvic floor and hold it for 10 seconds and then relax for 10 seconds. So we're gonna try this and let's see how you guys do. So sit up nice and straight. And I want you guys all to squeeze and hold I'm counting. And now relax. Y'all did good. I was looking to see if anybody was kind of incorporating bigger muscle groups. The big thing that women like to do is incorporate their glutes, their tummy <coughs> muscles, their um, inner thigh muscles, their hip adductors, and they incorporate the big muscle groups and not the tiny little muscles that are between your pubic bone and your tailbone. And so I was looking to see if anyone was going to go up. And you guys did it, so that's good. Um, if anyone has a hard time with that, you can, um, the, the thing you can do to try to find those muscles, it's called, well we don't want to do, it's called the faucet exercise. How many of you heard to, when you urinate, stop the stream midway? Okay, that is not an exercise to do. That's more of a proprioceptive thing for you to see which muscles should be firing. Women who um, <coughs> fire, do that as a strengthening exercise, can really mess up their maturation, which is their urination because um, how your bladder and your pelvic floor works is they do opposites. So right now you're all sitting there, and your pelvic floor is contracted, and your, and your bladder is relaxed, filling up with urine. When you go sit on your toilet, your pelvic floor will relax, and that tells your bladder to contract. And so if you're in the middle of contracting this bladder and relaxing your pelvic floor, and then you start squeezing this, it gives it mixed signals. And I have patients who've been incorrectly told to do that, and then when I ask them, do you have a hard time with urination? Is it hard to initiate a urine strain? They'll say, yes, it is. My urine stream slow down. It's because we're messing up this maturation cycle. So if you do the faucet exercise, you can do it to try to leave here and see which muscles for sure am I supposed to be contracting. Um, you can do that. You can do it maybe once a month to see if you're getting stronger. Maybe today you can't stop your strain, but you can just kind of make the strain move a little bit. And then next month, after you're exercising, you can actually get the stream to almost stop. It's more of a way to you to see that you're getting better, you're getting stronger. But don't use it as a way of strengthening. So that's the Kegels. Also, what you can do, um, you probably don't want to do this part here sitting down, but you can put your finger right on your perineum, which is the skin between your vagina and your anus, and just fill. You should fill it kind of go up um, when you contract your pelvic floor. And they, it's important also not to bring in the bigger muscle groups. So while you do your, your kegels, um, put your hands on your tummy muscles. Try to make sure that they stay pretty quiet. Your tummies will still contract a little bit, but you want them to be pretty quiet. Um, also, you can you know, check your glutes or your inner thigh muscles. But try to fill. So you guys just did a 10 second contraction. Now we're gonna do our fast twitch. We're gonna do our fast twitch muscles. So let's go ahead, sit up, and we're going to squeeze and relax. Squeeze and relax, squeeze and relax. So that's another exercise. Your fast ones, squeeze, relax, and your slow ones where you're gonna squeeze and hold for 10 seconds. So those are your traditional kegels. Some people aren't strong enough to do those, and they need to do pre-kegels, which I won't go into today. Um, some of you sitting in a chair, you're having to lift your pelvic floor against gravity, that might be too 
hard, so you might have to lay down to do it. Some of you are strong enough, you can do it in standing, you can do it while you're walking with activity. Um, so those are ways you can kind of progress your exercises. Because if all of you, if you all did the same exercise every day in the gym and you never mixed it up or progressed it, you're, you're gonna plateau in your strength. And that's the same thing with the pelvic floor. So if you guys find that the Kegel exercises are pretty easy and you think you're doing them well, um, I wanna teach you another one. This is my favorite exercise and all exercises in the exercise kingdom. And I'm a PT, <laughs> that says a lot. So it's called the elevator exercise. So we're going to pretend, right now before you guys were squeezing, you probably squeezed as hard as you can and relaxed it. Now we're gonna do slow graded. So you're gonna sit there and we're going to pretend our pelvic floor is an elevator and it's going to go up three flights of stairs, let people on our elevator and come down three flights. So we're going to go up a third, a third, all the way up. Ready? Go ahead and squeeze a third, another third, all the way up and hold it. People get on and off our elevator, come down a third, down a third, go down. Did you guys find going up was easier or going down was easier? Going up was easier because it's a concentric contraction. Correct. And so, um, so that's something you can do to even progress yourself on these. Another exercise I mentioned, uh, I kind of had said earlier not to bring in your bigger muscle groups. If you're going to bring in something, the research has shown us that our transverse abdominis, these are our deep tummy muscles. So if you to put your two fingers on your ASIS, on your little bones here, and go down two fingers down and in, pull your, your belly button into your spine. And hopefully you're going to feel some muscles contracting. That's your transverse abdominis. Um, if you're going to do some, um, kind of bring in a couple muscle groups, bringing in that transverse abdominis while you're doing your pelvic floor is also um, a good thing for you. There was a study that showed women who did their pelvic floors why they also incorporated those muscles. Um, they, they were, what was it, eight weeks of doing those exercises, they were 89% um, cured of incontinence. These were middle-aged women with stress incontinence. How often they recommended? Well, they, they didn't do it enough, I didn't think. I, what I would recommend um, women to do these between 30 and 80 contractions a day, to spread throughout the day. You would never want to do all 80 at once. But 30 to 80 days. This study, they did 30, they only did it three times a week. Um, but if you do these every day, I see big changes in my patients. So, um, so anyways, if you're going to bring in those transverse abdominis, it's, it's, it can be, you know, co-contracted with the pelvic floor. Um, don't hold your breath. If you tend to hold your breath, just count out loud. And then also, you know, not to bring in those big glutes or the, the adductors. So biofeedback is another um, tool that we use in the clinic to help women. I just took copies of two of my patients. This lady here was a lady in her 30s. She had more urgent continence. So she didn't have really too weak of a pelvic floor. Um, the red is her pelvic floor. The blue is her abdominals. Versus this lady here, she was um, stress incontinence, very weak pelvic floor. So you can kind of see the difference in, in the strength. And so um, in the clinic, we bring them in and then they can compare from visit to visit how their, how their strength is changing and improving. Electrical stimulation is also another tool to use for incontinence. Um, this is when you have a little handheld device and you put um, an internal probe in the vagina or the rectum and you turn on the electricity. Um, but anyway, it, it really helps to strengthen the muscles as well as help identify those muscles. And there was a study here where they did this um, 12 sessions twice a week for six weeks, 20 minutes, and they had significant improvement in their strength, their decreased urine leakage, and their poop quality a lot, just by doing these stem nothing else. Pesaries, has anyone heard of these? These are what we call orthotic. Um, they're they're a, a plastic device that you put inside the vagina and it helps hold, um, if you have prolapse, things are falling, it helps hold the organs up as well as it compresses on that urethra. And there was a study that 80% um, of patients improved with a pessary. Um, it doesn't correct anything, it's just, a, it just is there temporarily to help hold things up. Um, I will tell you this from meeting patients with pessaries, it's a real love-hate thing. Either patients love these, think they're the greatest thing, or they hate them, want them out, they want something else done to them. Um, but that's also an option. Topical estrogen for women who are postmenopausal. Putting estrogen, this is just the local, the 
topical decree you put in the vaginal tissue, not the kind you take by pill by mouth. Um, but topical estrogen brings blood supply to the tissues. And so we have, on our um, urethra, we have an external sphincter, which is our pelvic floor muscles, but right above it, we have an internal sphincter. And estrogen brings blood supply. Blood supply causes the tissue to plump up and to close things. So um, women who are postmenopausal without any estrogen, their internal sphincter can start to look like this. And it doesn't really give them any safety guards for incontinence. So by using topical estrogen, it can plump it up again and, and it can provide some more um, help at that gate to keep things close. So those are more of the, um, of, of the non-invasive and also the pharmacologic. The two things you can do more invasively for stress incontinence, one of them is um, bulking injection. So, you know, in Hollywood, you have collagen for your lips to bulk them up. Here we have collagen for the, the urethra to bulk it up. And so the doctor will go in and put some collagen down in here by the bladder neck and the urethra, and that helps bulk it up to help as a, as a more of a gate to keep you from leaking. And then, of course, there's also the different um, surgeries. Lots of different surgeries out there. The mid-urethral slings are more the newer ones that you're seeing being done. Um, cure rate at two years is 66% according to ALBO in 07. I just wanted to, to mention on this, if you guys have heard the FDA warning on the mesh, lots of commercials and stuff, um, that is different than this. That mesh, um, the FDA's warning is for pelvic organ prolapse and it's not these slings. So just to let you know there is a difference between those. So those are stress. Basically we need to help with the gait. Now let's learn how to tame this naughty teenage bladder here um, with urge incontinence. So the treatment's gonna be different because it's a whole different etiology. Um, behaviorally, we can still do our strengthening exercises. Also, uh, contracting the pelvic floor can also get that muscle to, um, bladder muscle to relax. Biofeedback, electrical stimulation, we can use a different setting and help with urge. Um, but I'm gonna jump right into the dietary changes. So if you have urge, you have the strong urge to go to the bathroom, or you have a key in the door, um, or hearing running water, one thing you can do is fluid management. A lot of women with incontinence think, I better not drink because I don't want to leak all over the place. So if I limit how much I drink, I won't leak. In actuality, that's not really a good idea because by limiting how much you drink, especially water, you are making your urine more concentrated. And a more concentrated urine irritates that bladder even more and then you have a crankier teenage bladder who's gonna do its own thing. So it's important to drink enough water. Um, you know, six glasses a day is, is, is nice. They say, um, you know, some, some physicians don't like to give a, a number amount, they'll just say, I wanna make sure your urine looks like lemonade, more diluted. Um, and also, if someone who's urinating a lot at night, if you're premenopausal, zero to one time at night, you know, waking you up to go is considered normal, but postmenopausal, one to two times. If you're getting up more than that, um, maybe limiting your liquid consumption after 7 p.m. and just taking the bare minimum to take your pills, if you're taking pills like at night, um, could help you. Also, avoiding bladder irritants. There are certain things that the bladder does not like. Um, your citric acidic juices or your citric fruits, um, like your orange juices and your grape, uh, grapefruits, tomato products, so your salsas, your spaghetti sauces, Caffeinated drinks, carbonated beverages, even if they don't have caffeine, and alcohol. Those tend to be the things on the list. And what I tell women, because they really get bummed out, because you know, chocolate's considered caffeinated food too. Um, instead of saying, no, just, just don't take any of those, and you know, I, that's not gonna work. So what I tell women is, why don't you take all this out of your diet for just two weeks, and then slowly introduce one at a time. Because this is the textbook list. And sometimes textbook doesn't fit the individual. So if you slowly reintroduce one at a time after two weeks, you'll know very quickly whether that orange juice every morning is, is a bladder irritant to you or not. And that way you can identify specifically what are your irritants instead of just going by the textbook. Bladder retraining. People with urgent incontinence tend to go to the bathroom a lot. They go more than your normal five to eight times a day. And so your bladder, it gets used to thinking it only needs to hold small amount of urine. And a, a, a story to illustrate this is my father, who's a retired machinist. And we're 
he worked, um, they changed his break schedule to accommodate the smokers. And so they said, instead of having your 15 minute break, we're gonna give you a five minute break every hour. Well, my dad doesn't smoke, but he wants to get away from his machine. So every hour he'd go to the toilet. Well, the next thing you know, on the weekends when I'm hanging out with him, I'm noticing he's going to the bathroom all the time. And it's because his bladder got used to holding just one hour worth of urine. And it's telling it it's time to empty after an hour, because that's what it thinks is normal. So with bladder retraining, we're gonna retrain the bladder to hold more urine. And you should hold for about three to four hours worth of urine. And instead of just telling women, just hold it for three to four hours, that's not gonna work, they're gonna leak, they're gonna get all frustrated. So what we can do is um, bladder retrain. And so I have them take a diary and just keep track. How often are they going to the bathroom? And if they're going like my father every hour, I'll say, okay, this week you're going to push it for an extra 15 minutes. So we're gonna go an hour and 15 minutes before you go to the bathroom. And if you at that hour mark, man, you're getting those urges, you gotta go to the bathroom so badly, there's things you can do to try to help with that. One of them are those quick flip contractions which you guys did. The squeeze, the relax, squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax. Because what that's doing is your bladder and your pelvic floor do opposites. So if, you're, if your bladder's telling you, I gotta go, I gotta go, your pelvic floor can say, hey, be quiet here by contracting quickly five times. By this contracting, it'll make the bladder relax itself and chill out and give yourself um, self some more time before your time to go to the bathroom. So that's called quick flips, resetting parentheses is number three. That can be very, and I do this when I'm driving home from work, squeeze quickly five times. It, it'll usually make the urge go away. Um, diaphragmatic breathing, which Lori's gonna talk about here in a minute. And then even distraction games. You know, counting backwards from 100 by sevens, or trying to think of whose birthdays are in January, going, you know, each month by month by month. Just distracting yourself can make that urge go away. And then get to your, your, your goal of that hour and 15 minutes, or whatever your goal is go and then you know we'll keep going and after a week if you're successful increase it by another 15 minutes and keep doing that until you hit your three to four hour mark pharmacologic so with urge incontinence you can still the, the estrogen topical estrogen has been shown to help decrease the bladder um, spasming get it to relax more but the um, anti-muscarinics this are the drugs I put a bunch of them here you might have seen but it also can be effective in getting that bladder to relax the problem is, is that the receptors on the bladder for these drugs are also on your um, tear ducts and in your salivary glands and in your colon. So the, the side effects you see pretty regularly, it's pretty much universal, is the dry mouth, dry eyes, and constipation. So um, some women don't want to tolerate that. <coughs> there was a new drug that came out in the market in 2012 called um, Mirbutrix. And that works on different receptors. So you don't have those same side effects. So it's kind of good for women who, the anti-muscarinics works, but that maybe, you know, they can't stand the side effects. This could be a, a possible option for them, but there are other side effects, obviously, that these women have to deal with. For more invasive, there's Botox. You can actually get a lot of little um, Botox injections to the bladder. Um, it's performed in the clinic. It only takes about five to 10 minutes for the physician to do this, but you're in the clinic for about an hour, and Botox is gonna last about six to nine months, and then it's time to have to be re-Botoxed to the bladder. Um, 50 to 60% will have improvement with Botox injection. 10% will have temporary um, inability to void, so they might have to have a catheter, 10% of the population, just for a short time. Then there's the different um, sacral nerve uh, modulators. So this one's a percutaneous tibial, tibial nerve. And they put, this requires no surgery, um, no anesthesia. They just put an acupuncture needle in by the ankle of the tibial nerve, put some electricity to it, and that basically goes up to the, um, the sacral nerves and tells the bladder to relax. You do this once a week for 12 weeks, um, and then after that, it's more of a maintenance every month. So that's one option for those really bad um, urge issues. And then the other one is the sacral nerve stimulator. Has anyone heard of this one, the inner stem? No. This one is where they put, um, it requires two surgeries. The first one, they'll put a lead in attached to an outside battery box, and they'll try it out for about 10 to 14 days to see whether the urges get better. If they do, they can go in for a second surgery and implant a battery um, in that fatty area 
around around the hip, and um, and it'll it'll last for about five to seven years. But it's constantly sending you know electrical impulses to the bladder. So kind of like in physical therapy, I have a little handheld device. This one is more of a permanent full time one. Um, and so the big thing is you can't have any MRIs below the neck. And it has a 60 to 80 percent success rate. And success is defined as 50% um, improvement. So now I'm going to pass this on. We'll talk about our study. So we do have a couple of men here. So I just want to mention that the Kegels and pelvic floor exercises are um, really important for men, especially following the prostatectomy, and that there's um, significant improvements that typically occur um, for men who use um, pelvic floor exercises um, following prostatectomy. And, and I actually had a story where my father-in-law, after his prostate surgery, I surreptitiously told him, my husband told him what I told my husband to tell him about doing pelvic floor exercises. And um, he had serious issues with incontinence initially, but they completely resolved as a result. So he was a pretty happy camper, I have to tell you about that as far as that goes. Um, so one of the things that we know about how micturition, how urination occurs, and it involves our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, a nervous system. And so we want to make sure that the re one of the reasons why diaphragmatic breathing works is because it impacts that um, nervous system and really calms the bladder down. So the bladder doesn't want to contract because it contracts as a result of the parasympathetics. And so when we can calm the bladder down, then we'll have a reduction in its contraction. So um, the study that Tammy and I have currently going on is we're looking at the effect of this diaphragmatic breathing on women with urge incontinence. So our study is specifically exploring this with women with urge incontinence. So remember that's the naughty teenage bladder. Um, I love that description, Tammy. Um, and so uh, we're trying to use that diaphragmatic breathing to calm the bladder down, so to stop it from contracting when it's irritated. Um, so our study is a nine-week study. Um, Women come in, they, uh, we take a baseline, a three-week baseline measure where they're doing nothing. They're just doing their usual stuff. And we're trying to find out how often they're having episodes of incontinence. Um, and we also take some quality of life measures. Because as Tammy talked about at the beginning, quality of life is a huge issue for most women with incontinence. They have a lot of, um, you know, they might not want to participate in a lot of different activities, including um, intimate relationships with their partners. So this can be a big problem for them. So we really wanted to look at quality of life too. So our primary outcome measure are numbers of episodes of incontinence, but we also have been using an incontinence, um, a specific questionnaire that's looking at quality of life for individuals with incontinence. Um, we are looking specifically at women, so our study is focused on women, and we've talked a lot about women today. Um, and what we've been really excited about, uh, during the three, second three weeks, they do the intervention. So you have a strong urge to urinate, you do the diaphragmatic breathing intervention, and again, we're measuring and looking at how frequently do they have episodes of incontinence, um, we also ask them how strong their urge is, so we look to see if there's a change in the strength of their urge. Is that our note? No. Okay. Um, they, we look at the strength of their urge, and then we're also taking those quality of life measures. And then during the final three weeks, we do another baseline where we ask them to stop doing the diaphragmatic breathing, which in this type of design, obviously some of them are like, but it's working, why would I want to stop? But we ask them to stop, and then they, we take those measures again and look at quality of life and um, number of episodes of incontinence. And so what we've been really excited about, we've had... We had like two, but we also had that earlier pilot. Yeah, we've had, we've had, I think, a total of like six subjects all total, including our earlier pilot, and then the two participants who we've analyzed so far. Um, and the big thing that we've seen is a huge 
and change in quality of life and that quality of life measure. So um, for us, that's been really big. Now the participants that we've had so far have had, haven't had very severe urinary incontinence. So severity defined by the numbers of episodes per week. And so most of our women, some of them haven't even had one episode per day. Um, I think one of the subjects only had like one episode per week. Um, so we haven't seen a significant decrease in the numbers of episodes of incontinence, but that might be because our participants so far haven't had a lot of incontinence. But their quality of life measure has increased significantly in the subjects that we've had so far. So we're pretty excited about that because we think that that's probably at least, if not more important, um, than episodes of incontinence. So that's our study. And then we have one last little slide here. When you're talking about this kind of subject, you have to start with something funny and end with something. <laughs> so I guess we'll open it up for questions. to do with a sense of um, control because for anybody who's ever experienced incontinence of any sort, stress or urge, it's that sense of, oh, I can't believe that happened. You know, you sneeze and you're incontinent. Damn. And um, so we think that it's related to that sense of being in control so that when you get to the door and you put your key in, Maybe you have a little sense of that urgency, but because you use the diaphragmatic breathing technique and it reduces that sense, you're like, oh, well, I can make it to the bathroom. So we think that that's what it's related to. Right. And also the, the subjects we've had had more of a, they were mixed, they had more of a stress component causing the leakage. So that's probably why we haven't seen a reduction also in the number, because they were leaking because of stress, but they also had urge issues too, because they got in our study. But their number of urges might be going down as well for them. Yeah, because, I mean, think about it. If you have urgency and your pelvic floor is super weak, well, you have very little chance, right, then of controlling leakage because your pelvic floor can't work for you. So, I know it's probably not part of your study, but is there any correlation that you guys have found in your research? I mean, like when you're <clears throat> needing to go and you're telling yourself, no, i got to hold it out a few more times. I mean, I'll be sitting there like, And then we have them put their hands on their um, stomach here. And so diaphragmatic breathing, you should see an expansion of your belly when you take a nice deep breath. And so most of us breathe more up here. So we teach them to do um, a, a deep breath where they go and they expand their belly and then relax. So it doesn't put any pressure that way. 
it doesn't put any pressure that way. And then relax. And if I didn't, I mean, I only had a few moments to go over pelvic floor exercises, but if you if you want to do it truly correctly, you would always want to breathe in as you relax your pelvic floor and blow out as you're contracting your pelvic floor. And there has been research showing a correlation with proper breathing while you do the exercises. You it tend you get more for it. Does that answer your question? Yes. And they do that technique every time they have a stroke. And they do it five minutes in the morning and five minutes yeah, in the night time as well. And then throughout the day if they're having a strong urge. Our first, our pilot study um, subject, she had terrible urge incontinence and she her, her numbers of leaks dropped from 21 down to three leaks a week. And then we took away the intervention and she went right back up to 21 leaks. So that was one of our pilot studies that started what we're doing now. Yeah, and she was very unhappy when we told her she should have stopped. <laughs> If anyone's interested in being a participant in the study, I did leave my business cards in the back, so if you want to grab one, um, let me know. Um, all you need to do is we're doing bladder diaries, question of life, um, or quality of life questionnaire, so no one has to show any body parts, anything like that. It's just all paper. <laughs> or if you know somebody. <laughs> 